Bailey, a longtime educator in Whitley County, is here with us today uh, in the Peabody Public Library on uh, September 22nd, 2009. And I'm John Pontius for the Whitley County Oral History Project. Thank you for being here, Ralph. It's, it's an honor. How long have you uh, lived in Whitley County? Well, it goes back uh, to 1951. Okay. And where did you grow up? I grew up in Pearson, not too far away. Okay, was it in Pearson or near Pearson? It was near Pearson. I was a farm boy. I was one of those kids that okay. one pair of pants when I went to school, and that's the ones we had for all year. So. Okay. I assume you, uh, while you were going to school, you worked a lot on the farm. That's exactly right. Did a lot of work on the farm. What uh, kind of things did you do? I'll tell you what, we did everything. Back in those days, you know, the farmers, they had cows, they had horses, they had pigs, they had goats, and they had about everything you can think of, and chickens running around every place. So uh, we got all of our food off of the farm, and so it was quite unique compared to today, so. <clears throat> yes. Um, what school uh, did you go to uh, in, in grade school and high school? In the beginning, I was, uh, in Goshen, Indiana, and I went to a one-room school, and they had eight grades. And so, when you begin to think back, eight grades, and so I think I learned a lot by just listening to what the teacher was teaching the other eight grades. So, uh, maybe it wasn't all bad for me. <clears throat> Were there any teachers that uh, had a uh, big influence on your life and, and your, <clears throat> your choice of uh, career? Yes, I would say the one was uh, Madeline Dunlap. And Madeline Dunlap was a teacher in Pearson in the fifth grade. And there was something about the way she treated me and made me feel I was, uh, you know, I felt very inferior. Of course, some days I think I'm maybe I am still inferior, but I don't know that. Say. But back then, I knew I, I felt inferior, and she had a way of making me feel that I was special. And that's the reason today that I spent a lot of time doing the I can if I think I can things because she made me believe I can do something more than what I was doing. And uh, I give her a lot of credit. I think she was, I think her husband at one time might have had a gas station out where the dance studio is now. Okay. Um, so um, what did you do uh, right after school? Um, uh, what did, what did you do after high school? Okay. Well, after high school, of course, <clears throat> I, uh, I worked at about three different places. Number one, I started at Whitley Products, and then <clears throat> I worked down at Reed Murdoch's, which is a tomato factory back in those days. It was a big thing. Worked at the Dalton Foundry, and I never could find the right thing for me. So I, I, it was a good thing that I worked at those places because I think that got me encouraged to go ahead and go to college. But then in between that time, I'd gone to the Army. So I was in the Army about one year and one month. I was the last draftee they'd taken in. And about when was that? Uh, in other words, that would have been in 19, you know, let's see, about 1948, 49, I think something. Okay, and um, what did you do in the, in the Army? <clears throat> well, of course, Come to think about it, it was I graduated in '45, so I went in the army in '46, and that's just as the, the war was declared over World War II, and I said I just uh, typed uh, discharges for people coming back overseas. So I said I was fortunate; I uh, had a good job in the army, and I didn't have to do any of the overseas things. But I got to talk to a lot of people as I worked with their discharge. Uh, typing out their things, so it was quite a, quite a good job. Then you went to college. And then I came back and went to college. Okay. It was just so I worked on the railroad for a while as a brakeman. So. Okay, so this was to help uh, go to college, help? Right, with a combination of, uh, the, that's one of the things I think maybe it wouldn't be all bad for a lot of young people to go to the Army, and okay. mainly because that's where I basically got my education, because out of seven children in my family, I was the only one that ever went to college. 
things. Uh, I had a couple of brothers in the Battle of the Bulge, so they kept me updated on a lot of things at that time. Older brothers. Right. Um, what made you decide to become, uh, get, to go into education, <coughs> become a teacher? Well, I think mainly the basis of it is goes all the way back to Madeline Dunlap. And I had some other good teachers as I went along and they encouraged me. And I said, as I think back, you know, back then we didn't have counselors in school. And I've often wondered, you know, if they'd had counselors because I wasn't one of those uh, kids that everybody thought I'd be anything. And so I was uh, just from a poor family. And so they probably said, you better go back to the farm. But thank goodness I had some teachers that encouraged me to go on, and uh, and the family did too. So when you graduated from uh, college, then you, uh, where did you start teaching then? Okay, in 1951 I started teaching at Kwesi. I said the amazing part about it is I majored in English, minored in science, majored in business, and uh, when I went out to look for a job, they wanted me to teach English everywhere I went. And I didn't, I, I only took English because I was from the farm and I had a lot of the farm language. So it was a blessing for me, but I didn't know it at that time. John Bachman, a lot of people knew him here. He was a trustee mm -hmm. on the Union Township and he hired me and uh, it was the best thing that could ever happen. I taught the fourth and fifth grade. Okay. Um, so was back then was uh, discipline uh, a problem in, at any time? No. Well, not for me. I said we had in the fourth and fifth grade. I said I, I had uh, two groups. So I had the fourth grade and the fifth grade, and of course there was about the reason. You know, there's some mischievous little guys I can still remember, and I mm -hmm. see I see them once in a while today, but they were not. Ornery, but when I when I spoke and said something, I mean they listened, which uh, okay. was, was uh, good for me. I'll always remember one of the great ladies, Mary Dow, who uh, most everybody in this town knew Mary Dow, a teacher. And teacher. she was a teaching there, and she was teaching music, and she came in, and she was very straight laced. And I thought, guys, she was kind of, you know, kind of tough in a way, and it was kind of interesting. One day she said to me, she said, you know, I've never seen such a great change in those students. And you've been here and they're really great and I just enjoy coming in the room. From then on, Mary Dow was my favorite teacher. Okay. So it's always good to have somebody compliment you. Okay. Let's go back to when you were in school. All right. Um, <clears throat> how different was the curriculum then? Well, I think back then, you know, we had usually the, just the four basics and, uh, and like started. reading writing and arithmetic right you bet that's okay. pretty much what it was and i said we didn't it much more limited right very limited compared to today but i said you know it's like most things if you really uh, try hard enough and do the thing even you may not have the best curriculum but a lot of it depends upon you and and the attitude that you take about school and how you work on it so, mm -hmm. Now, back then when you were in school, uh, were, uh, d did the farm boys tend to uh, drop out maybe during farming season? Uh, or? Well, the nice part about back then, the school didn't start as early and okay. it didn't go as late, so we could do a lot of farming. And I said I, you know, I did one sport, and that was basketball. And one time my dad indicated to me, he said, where were you? And of course, basketball season was over. And I said, I went off for track. He said, you know, we got too much farming. There's plenty of running around right here to do. You don't have to be okay. doing those activities. So I said, I think that's what is kind of interesting when you really look back. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't realize I had it uh, like I did, but what a blessing today is. Um, so how did you get to school? back then? Well, fortunately for us, we had a bus. Of course, at that time, that bus that we had had a hot pipe that went right back through the, the thing okay. from the muffler to keep the, the bus uh, heated. Okay. And sometimes people burn their legs on that. Today, they probably get sued for it. <laughs> okay, and how many were in your class about when you were going to school? Well, kind of interesting. When I first started in the first grade, I had uh, one other student. 
in that one room school. Oh. Then when I went to Pearson, I thought, what a mammoth school, because there's about 25, 28 in most classes. Mm -hmm. So then uh, you, how long were you at Quessy? Uh, well, Quessy was there two years. And then you moved on to? Yeah. I had taught fourth and fifth, and then I had the fifth and sixth. The Bachman's daughter was an elder, Kathy Bachman was in the elder group, and so uh, the trustee, he was the one that said, I'd like to have you have my, teach my daughter another year, so he moved uh, me up with the two grades. So I moved right up where they had that whole group two years. Okay. So hopefully I made some influence on them someplace. But, uh, and then where did you go from Then there? I went as principal over at Edna Troy. And I was 25 years old, and as I look back today, I think the good Lord had to be with me an awful lot because everybody was older than I am. The teachers were older, you know, the mm -hmm. parents were, most of them were older than I was. And I said, and I had the interesting thing, we had about 250 students back then, which is about the same size as it was when they closed. Uh, I taught all day. I taught the seventh and eighth grade all day long. And, and, well, you were principal? principal? Right. Okay. And I didn't have a secretary. And, of course, uh, lunch money I'd take home at night, and my wife would help me count it and so forth. I I coached all the sports while I was there, we had. Okay. So, so uh, I thought I had a great job. My first year I got $2,800 for the whole year, and the second year as principal I got 4000 so I thought I had life made. So. Okay, uh, and then what? where did you go from there? Okay, <clears throat> from there, I was there for 10 years as principal. And the interesting thing, uh, one of the trustees' daughter had married uh, Trayton Burns, who was a person from, uh, I heard his dad was on the school board in West Noble. And this guy said, we, he just got done being trustee, Orville Tuggle. He said, well, why don't you try to hire out Bailey? So they came down and talked to me. I said, I'm not interested because I'm happy what I'm doing. I didn't want to deal with high school students. So, and so they said, oh, come on up and interview. So I went up to interview, but I didn't put any necktie on. I didn't, because I didn't want the job. And so when I was there, they asked me a question and said, well, uh, how much do you want? And they said, well, that's, uh, that's more than the superintendent's getting, so they hired me. So then I was there for three years. And that was one of the best moves I ever made because I was there for three years, and then I went here as superintendent. Okay, uh, when you were there, about what year was that? Uh, well, let's see, I was 51, 53, there, 53 to 63, and 63 to 66, and I came here in 66. And um, while you were principal at, uh, uh, where, where did you live at that time? Okay, at first, of course, I bought a 40-acre farm out here in Etna Troy, and so... In Etna Troy, okay. And so, the first year, so I, at the end of the first year, I told them I wasn't coming back. I was going to go back to there, but things just seemed to work out sometimes. And so I sold the farm, took the money that I had, took my four kids at that time to Muncie and to Ball State to get my uh, superintendent's license rented a professor's house. When I went there, I had four kids. When I came home, I had six, because I had twins there. So, okay. so I got my superintendent's license there. What, what, make, what made a good superintendent back then, do you think? Well, I don't know whether I was a good one or not, but some people would indicate. I think, number one, my one trait is that uh, I really cared what happened to kids, and I had cared about the staff. I didn't care to the staff, but that some people, even today, I see some superintendents who, who kind of consider them superior to others. Mm -hmm. well, I always felt we were a family, and that's the way we worked at, as a superintendent here in Columbus City. And I think you can talk to most of the staff, unless they had a run-in with me. I mean, most of them would say that the reason why we succeeded as good as we did because we looked at each other as family. Mm -hmm. And so I think caring that you really show you care. I mean, some people can act like it, but they don't show it. So I think uh, a good superintendent is one, number one, he has to have respect if you're going to stay very long. And I stayed here for 23 years, so I must have had some respect for somebody. Didn't have to leave when I did. And I said, it's just 
one of those things, if, if a teacher had a problem and they had to come to see me, I mean, it was, it was a problem for me too. Mm -hmm. I'm one of those sentimental guys. I could have tears feeling sorry for somebody else sometimes. And uh, that's just the way it works. So when I just finished this year over there, but uh, that's another story. Okay. Well, let's go back to uh, when you were principal in uh, Etna Troy. Uh, you lived on a farm. Right. And um, did you go to Etna for s supplies or clothes or groceries or? No, we, we came to uh, Columbus City most of the time. Okay. There's a lot of people. We went over there to some because they had a little store there at Etna and we, we got mm -hmm. some there. Right. And in Columbia City, where did you go, say, to buy groceries at that time? Well, I tell you, you know, it's kind of hard for me to really remember because I know there was a Williams store or something on the Williams side of grocery on the okay. side of town, but I didn't seem to be like uh, okay. And well, like clothes, where where in Columbia City at that time? Uh, well, it was uh, there used to be offers, and then there was uh, well, there was Strauss, Strauss and uh, Strauss. Let's see, which one was a school board member at one time? Uh, and he was a great guy. They had the, the whole. I uh, I, I, I can't get to that either. I said because there, Troy, really went in and because it was on the on the corner there, right where Ashley Gervin of the Fever is now. Okay, it wasn't Strauss. I don't think it was Strauss. Okay, uh, but I could know it wasn't okay. Strauss. Okay. Strauss. Um, uh, it was very different. This was in the fifties. Right. It was, life was very different uh, than it is now, wasn't it? Very much different in the sense, uh, you know, even when you go back even further, we just went to free shows, you know, when we were kids. And so a lot of times we didn't know anything other than free shows as far as... What, what do you mean free shows? Okay, <clears throat> back when I was a kid, of course, Pearson had free shows on... Uh, Wednesday night and Saturday night. For kids? For kids and adults and so forth. Okay. And like at Larwell, for example, they also, so that was on Friday night. So we got to come over there and see the, you, know, you had to bring your chair along and so forth, and sit outside and watch the shows. So it was outside? Outside. All these were outside. In, okay. In the, in the park, yeah. And were they regular movies that you could see? Uh, well, I really liked a lot of them. Some much better than I do some of them today yeah, because see. a lot of them are westerns. We really loved the western type shows back then. So. Okay, so like uh, Gene Autry or? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> it seems to be Gene Autry and of course I don't recall whether the Lone Ranger's in there, but I know I listened to the radio because that's all we had back in the early days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so, uh, these little towns would uh, show, what if it rained? Well, then <clears throat> they'd call it off. They would call it off. Right, yeah. Okay. So, but it, it was a nice thing because on Saturday nights people came to town and they visited and it was a social time thing. Now, you know, you don't see any of that, but which is, I think uh, we miss a lot. Well, uh, I assume you, uh, most people went to a church and uh, they had a social <laughs> life there. Yes, yeah, some of them did. My parents didn't go to the church, but my mother probably knew more about the Bible than any person mm -hmm. I've ever uh, ran across, because she could quote things and do things, and I said she had a great influence on my life. Was uh, back when you were uh, a kid, did, did the uh, depression affect your family? And Very much so, because <clears throat> I was born in 1927, and that's right in the period of time which was really pretty tough. And of uh, course, I didn't know we were poor. Of course, you know, Dad worked, I think one time, it got as much as a dollar a day, but sometimes he didn't find any money, but we had cows to milk, and, and so, we were able to continue to eat and so forth. I mean, we had a Model T Ford, which I remember, which was pretty popular back in those days. We were lucky to have a, a car to drive. Um, so um, it, you you weren't uh, you really didn't feel you were in a, a, a big depression at that 
at that particular yeah, time. I did not sense that because it gradually grew out of that soon thereafter. But the big thing is we knew that we were just uh, as poor as, but we didn't know it because about everybody else was yeah. at that time. So. Now, uh, do you remember when electricity first came in your house? Yeah. Yes, I do because we, the neighbor got it before we did, but the line went right by our house up there, and boy, were we looking forward to that electricity because you used the kerosene lanterns, the kerosene lamps, and all those good things, and even carried them down to the barn and hung them up. I don't know why more barns weren't burned down back those days because you did hang them on a, and you would use cobwebs and stuff. But no, it was, <clears throat> it was. Uh, so, so I assume then when you uh, got electricity then you had uh, inside bathroom and plumbing and well, we running water? Well, we didn't write it first. Not right yeah, away, no, okay. We had, the, we had the pit, you know, the old pump outside there that uh, we had to get, well, what is it, the old ones that had the big wheels on, I kind of go, you see them at the fair out here, four race quite a bit, mm -hmm. and I said that pumped her water out of the well into it. We were fortunate we had a milk house and it flowed into that and then it flowed into a system and it flowed down to the barn. That was pretty pretty modern. Mm -hmm. Well do you think uh, there were some ways in which uh, life was maybe better uh, back then like uh, you were closer to uh, your neighbors and uh, yeah I don't know that it's was better, but I mean, I think there's a lot of things we learn from that, because just like my brother and I, we worked on the fishing rig, and, and, and then they'd have farmers come in, everybody, and then they'd pick up the bales of hay and put them on the way, and then take them up, and my brother and I would put the water underneath the, the wagon for them, and they'd go out and had their jugs, and they didn't think anything about it, tipping it up on their arm and so forth, and drinking right out of it. So we looked forward then to having, when they settled, they had an ice cream thing, and what a thing that was for us. And we didn't have much ice cream as a boy. Okay. But it was a social gathering, and it was so much different than today. Yeah. Which uh, people nowadays uh, are not as social with neighbors and uh, with uh, don't get together as much, and that's. So true in the sense, I mean, we live there by our neighbors. I mean, I, you know, I help them out once in a while when they need some help or something like that, but as far as socializing with our neighbors, and we have those who, we, you know, used to speak to and are friendly with, but not, not the same. They depended on one another back then. Yes. More yes. so than what you had to today. Yes. So did your, um, being, did your teaching uh, help you uh, a lot with um, with being superintendent. Was that helpful? Well, I, I definitely feel that I, of course we were, it was kind of different back there, quite a bit different, you know, when I was teaching because we had the county superintendent for the county schools and, and the trustee was the one who really was the boss. But I think I was pretty fortunate because I had Harry Yoder when I first started and I said there's things that he did that made you feel that he cared about you. And even though I was a teacher and so forth, and I said, uh, it was just, uh, I don't know that anybody really stood out that really made me feel like it. I think once you get in the job, you kind of learn. Okay. You have to learn pretty fast yes. sometimes. Okay, uh, and you're looking back, um, are there some, uh, memorable teachers uh, or memorable students uh, under you? Well, I said, uh, the ones that, when I think about teachers, of course, there was uh, Howard Stolper, who was our coach, and he'd drive me home a lot of time. We lived three and a half miles from town, and so I'd run home most of the time and then back, because my dad was busy and didn't have time to do that. So he sometimes hauled me home, and he had he had that kind of a caring attitude that uh, helped him. He was uh, probably my one of my second in line. Cause he was okay. He was a great guy. He he really cared about you. Okay. Um, now in high school, uh, while you were superintendent, do you uh, remember some um, 
um, good teachers? Yes. I said, I'll, I won't really mention any of them because there's so many of them, really. Okay. But, I, I said, but I, can, I can tell you if I ask some students today who are some of your favorite teachers, they'll name, there's several on the table name, which time and time again, and, and you knew they were. I said, because they're just, because uh, all the teachers were good, they worked hard. Only thing is, we had some that I felt was somewhat inferior. We couldn't really pull them along as fast as we should be able to, but we had enough of the good teachers that made a lot of difference. I suppose I could name a couple, which I mean, this is the ones a kid would always respond to. It'd be like John Slavic, Jim Thompson. Okay. Just those kind of some of the more recent teachers. Some of the recent teachers. Yeah. Okay. Of course, Doc Holy Cross. I mean, he has to be maybe one of the outstanding teachers and principals in Whitley County. And what did he teach? See, Doc Holy Cross had social studies. Okay. And so he applied for the principal's job when I applied for it at Edna Troy, and because they just closed Larwell. Then from Larwell he went to Jefferson. So he taught social studies and he was sure that communism was going to take over the country real short and he gave a lot of talks on communism. He was uh, a great guy and a dedicated individual to make sure he put on a lot of uh, meetings and talked to people about, you know, I've been to even a couple of these meetings he went, had me go to because he thought the world was going to be taken over by communism. Okay. And it looked like they were for a while. Okay. All right. So you were, uh, what years were you superintendent here in, uh, in Whitley County? Okay, I started in 1966 okay. and I finished in 1989. So. Okay, and um, what did you do after that? Well, I said there's a whole line of things if we looked on that. I mean, there's quite okay. a number of did it. Because it just seems when I was doing one thing or another, I taught at Manchester College. Uh, for a while. And what did you teach there? Middle, middle school concepts. So. And middle school concepts, right. okay. And there's, there's a little difference between teaching the regular and then the middle school philosophy. And like I said, I've done, I don't know, 10 or so interims and the superintendents. I just okay. recently finished over at Warsaw. I've been there two full years out of the last four years. And for someone that hit 82 on Sunday, I said I feel pretty fortunate that I was 81 over there, and and still uh, I was caught when I the other three years before I was called to Warsaw to be a superintendent, and uh, I was there for a whole year, and then the guy came for two years, and then he called me back for another year. Now most people call that not too smart working at that age, but I said I don't play golf very much and. I don't do woodworking and fishing is not one of my things. My joy has always been working with people and I still enjoy that. Every time somebody sees an opening like Albion now, they said they they call and say, Hey, there's an opening up there. I said, I can't even imagine a board hiring somebody eighty one, alone eighty two, so Well, uh, going back when at the time you were principal at Adna Troy uh, was Whitley County, uh, do you think, much different than other counties around? No, I don't think so. I think, you know, we knew that, we knew that places like Warsaw and Fort Wayne was mm -hmm. different, but I think in general speaking... This was a more rural area. Right. Yeah. Other than that, I mean, because it had the wonderful people in Whitley County. Sense. And that's probably one reason why you stayed and not moved on to other places. Right. And I said, they treated me so well, I had probably, I don't know, probably 80 or 90 different board members during that period of time. And I said, uh, all of them are, treated me really great. I Did, said, is uh, any particular one memorable, uh, one or two or three? Yeah. No, I won't particularly mention those because I think they all are. I mean, of course, the one thing that I can remember mainly because of, of uh, Potch Wheeler. Cause from, see, from Anna Troy? So, see, I was principal out there when Potch was trustee. And okay. I up and left him 
just before school started when I went to West Noble, not expecting to get that job, because when they did tell me I had that job, I was sick almost. My wife and I, we didn't know what to do, but Potts Wheeler, he's the one that kind of encouraged me to come here. And Potts was one of those guys that even as a senator listened to listen to you and listen to people and so forth and so okay. Potts Wheeler I'd say outstanding but not, not necessarily any better than a lot of the other board members but I mean he was a person that stayed okay. with me and so forth. I was fortunate I gave a eulogy when he died and he only had Senator Garten and myself give the eulogy and so you can see we had a close relationship even though I didn't run around a lot with him, but we had a lot of fun together doing different things. And so. Well, back when you were principal at Edna Troy, um, when at Christmas time, um, did you have special events at school? Uh, well, they usually had an event that they put on, you know, we had the music teacher put them on. So. Okay. Of course, that's, that's one thing back then, we had a lot of the PTOs that but usually if you really wanted to get the parents to come, you almost had to have the kid. But yes, we had some Christmas program and things like that. So mm -hmm. it was and good memories, good memories. So parents back then, uh, there was a parent-teachers organization uh, at that time? Right. Mm -hmm. And did they they uh, get involved? And uh, They did quite a bit. I said they ran a, <coughs> well, it's called, it was uh, Edna Troy, uh, Call them the carnival things that they put on and so forth, and they raised money, and then they'd give me the money. That's the odd part about it. They gave me the money to spend it for whatever I really needed, and then for you know, the that's kind of unusual because they like to, a lot of times, hang on to it. But and they made a a lot of a uh, lot of money. And uh, later on, um, these uh, school events. Uh, evolved and changed, I, I assume. Uh, yeah. See, I was fortunate as a coach. Now, I'd like to think that it was because I was a good coach, but it didn't help to have somebody like Bo Johnson's boy or Willie Tuckles on there because and I could name a lot of boys I had who were good ball players, and they turned out to be good ball players later on. But I still think as a coach, because we had 116 wins and 13 losses, and so I had a lot of people come to these ball games. At Columbia, so, in Columbia City? At, so when I was at, at Detroit there. Oh, in Detroit. Yeah, we played uh, all, of course back then, uh, the junior high attorney took in Cherubusco, South Whitley, Jefferson, Washington. So you had quite a junior high attorney thing. So. So, so I brag about that a little bit. The only okay. real success I think I've had is then, but not, some people might not have thought that. So back then, uh, you had uh, all these townships. Most townships had their own school, uh, grade school. Grade school. And even at high schools. Uh, yeah, see, when I came there at the Troy, they had just formed Etna, and it was Troy. So there were two schools, Edna and Troy. But that was just before I came. Okay. And I was hired in after they were put together. The trustee, Eddie Pugh, said to me, he said, whatever you do, make sure you call it Edna Troy. Don't say Edna or Troy because that'll upset those people. So, okay. So uh, that's the way the consolidation was from Troy out there. And they had a high school and those kids, I don't know, that some of them went to Webster, I think. Some of them went to Plum City. Uh, life was uh, very different when uh, uh, you had a high school for each township, and uh, we the, the teams played in other townships, and uh, I, I imagine it was uh, kind of uh, disappointing to uh, a lot of people in those townships when they had to consolidate. Right. Well, it, 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 uh, and that was one of the big things. I mean, we know that that sports is is very important to the people and they were concerned that their child wouldn't get on the team because it was a bigger team. Of course, I think there's a lot of a lot of advantages to the small school in a lot of ways, but I mean the curriculum advantages are I think far superior to what we had in back in the one room school. But we had some because most of us know or all of us I think pretty well know if you have the right teacher you really have the right curriculum. So the big thing is to make sure when you employ people, you employ the 
best teachers. And if they aren't good, then get rid of them before they get their two years in now. So are you saying that uh, back, say, in Quesi and in Detroit, uh, maybe the building wasn't the best, but if you had a good teacher, that's what meant the most. That's the most, right. And I think it's still true today. I said, we, okay. got, we got some of those teachers, I know that, like Lori Style, I'd send a lot of kids on to college because of what she did and how she put it together. Well, just how bad were some of the buildings back then? Uh, were they heated uh, well, well enough? Yeah, they were, because you know, when you live with something, you, you adjust to it. You get used you to it. You don't know there's anything any better. Okay. And, and the big thing there was, you know, uh, the teachers could open the winter windows in the wintertime because it's too hot in there, or they could twist the knob on the radiator and okay. twist the radiator down. I mean, it was all adjusted, but not, we didn't have thermostats and all those good things. I said one week the custodian was sick for about uh, two weeks, so I took over being the custodian as well. And had some kids help me, and I, the worst thing that I ever had to do is continue to fire the boiler with coal. And when you fired a boiler, you was worried you had to watch that water to make sure it didn't blow up. And I was hoping while I was doing that, it didn't blow up. Okay. It was just the you know the old type uh, heating units and everything, but you know when you're living that. I don't think you notice it. Now I've had to go back to that same thing, because that's one of the things I do now, is work with the performance services who, they just go in and, and solve energy problems by putting in new controls, new boilers, and so forth. Warsaw, as new as they are, they spent $30 million, and we ended up saving $300,000 a year energy. So you can see I got a plug in there for performance services. But, yeah. No. Did, uh, say, at Kwesi and in Detroit, uh, were you uh, more free to teach how, how you teach and what you, what you wanted to teach than you would nowadays, I uh, assume? I, I presume maybe that I just didn't know any different, but I mean, I just taught and nobody bothered me. So. Okay. In a sense, I mean, you know, they knew I was there and they felt I was doing a good job and so they let you along. Okay. I imagine, too, that they, those principals had some, and, and I did, too, uh, once in a while when I was a principal like at Troy, that they were uh, where you wanted them, so you had to work with them. Yeah. So, pretty fortunate, though. Okay. Um, and, um, it, say, in, uh, in Troy, uh, in, in an average class, how many kids were there? Well, I taught. Like I said, as principal, I had uh, 34, I think it was. Okay. Two classes, though. Okay. But they, they were some small classes, there were some large ones, but usually they were in the 30s, if I recall right, I don't know. Now, uh, nowadays, uh, the classes are similar size, are they? No, well, unfortunately, they're growing back up there. It's, the best thing that ever happened was prime time, and that's when you had only there to have 18 to one teacher in the classroom, and so it got to be too costly. So the governor and the legislators, in their not good wisdom, took that away because 18 may seem small, but I tell you, 18. These kids need more than just education; they need some loving and caring and, and follow through and so forth. And so when they took, they didn't take prime time away, they just put it in the overall formula. And when you do that, you just lost a lot. Was it unusual when you first began teaching to, for men, where there were many more women teachers, I assume, back then? Well, especially at Edna Troy when I was a principal there. We had more, but then I just ended up getting a couple men in there. Which okay. Did a good job too. But I mean, women. Were, I think back when I was at Pearson, because you know, if mostly I, it was on the. Well, they were just about. They were all women except one okay. of them when I got to sixth grade. And uh, if I recall right, uh, they indicated that the women were not to be married when they were teaching the children. So that goes way back to a rule that they had. Okay, well. And, and that got over pretty fast. Though. And what reason was there for that? 
Well, I, I, I can't figure that one out. Okay. Uh, so okay. that, that would be a difficult one because, you know, we know that uh, a lot of ways, if they've had some children, they understand children too, but they're not yes. necessarily, we have some good ones that never did get married, but it's still, yeah. I think you understand children if you have to live with them 24 hours a day where mm -hmm. so there's a lot of difference in the way you look at teaching and I think the big thing is caring and want those to achieve and do the very best they can and so forth. I'm just, I just picked up four cards from my grandson that a, and a granddaughter that's in college right now and I send them a little money, you know, every month and, mm -hmm. and on that I, I try to encourage them but I said, you know, it's uh, the thing is, they need to know that somebody is there also supporting them and caring. And I think that's true. If we're going to do good for you, we've got to have people that enjoy their work. I have a book home now I haven't read yet, Joy at Work. And mm -hmm. I think if you really enjoy your job, you're going to enjoy going to work. And so that's with teachers. And it uh, bothers me, of course, uh, this book indicates, you know, if you can't be happy or you're working, don't be there. And I think that's what makes a good teacher. And we know teaching hard, and we know sometimes they grumble a little about that. But I mean, a lot of times they have a right to. Uh, back in Kwesi and Edna Troy, did uh, the kids tend to uh, drop out and not go to high school? Uh, more, more, much more. Well, I, I think so. they probably did more so, but I said I don't remember because it wasn't connected with the high school. Okay. Much, but I think, in general, they probably, they probably did, and I know it's. But it, it, it depends, like I said, uh, the parents' encouragement and then the attitude of the kids. Mm -hmm. So um, very, very different back then. Um, yeah. Is there? Um, Anything else uh, that you would um, care to add to all this? No, I can't think of anything. If you have some more questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them. But I said, I think in general, I said it was just really good to, to be able to be a part of education during the period of time I was, because probably we made the greatest improvements in, in education from the time 1951 till the time that I just finished at Warsaw this year, and so I think. We were fortunate because schools are doing a lot better job in what they're getting credit for. And okay. I said these, I could say something about the I-STEP test because I think they're one of the worst things that they get invented. They should have had tests that were good tests. But I said in a, in a sense that they rate them and there's so many, I'm not going to go into that now. Okay. But I'm not happy with I-STEP, I'll tell you. Okay. Not the way they do it. Uh, I would like to hear uh, more about the uh, the consolidation of schools in Willie County. Uh, uh, why did that happen? Okay, I think it goes back to 1951 when I started teaching. So that's when I began to know more about Willie County. And we had, you know, we had Quesi, we had Jefferson, we had Washington. Uh, there might have been another one or two in there someplace. But anyway, uh, the thing is that they felt that they needed to do something bigger and better for kids. And that's when the board began to work. And in 1951, I remember, or soon thereafter, I remember having some meetings they'd have in different schools around. And I'd be there, and there's a lot of people. Uh, I can remember one, I always remember the good things about it, because this one lady, and I remember her name even, she got up and she said, well, I think we're doing such a great job here. Mr. Bailey is really doing great for my kid. So, I mean, a lot of them didn't want to give up their schools or high schools. But the thing is, uh, I think we consolidated before all the other schools did in a lot of ways. You know, you think, well, we're, uh, we're behind time because we had a joint high school forever. Well, we didn't because we were ahead of time because we had a school of 900 high school students long before the others ever consolidated. So we actually, in Whitley County, consolidated. The only thing is we didn't consolidate as we now are. Or, you see, it clear up to the time that I 
the superintendent in 66, we were not consolidated, but the only difference there was the middle school, but the high school. So it, we didn't change much when we consolidated in the sense of, of there. But back when they changed putting all the kid, high school kids in the high school, it was it was not a happy time for a lot of the parents. Okay, let's start at the beginning in the consolidation. What was the first consolidation? Um, but like Thorn Creek Township uh, started going to Columbia City High School, right? That was one of the first ones? Well, there's several of them at the same time, if I recall. Because okay. there's all of them, but at that time, uh, when they, uh, for example, the grade school would come up here, but all, all the schools did, there's about three or four or five, let's see, because I remember the grade schools would begin to come in here some of them didn't have high schools anyway. For example, Columbia Township. Columbia Township, right. Okay. And uh, Thorn Creek, I don't know when they had a high school, whether they didn't have a high school. They, they did, maybe for a year or so. Uh, and, but, uh, and, and then so Columbia Township and Thorn Creek uh, started coming to Columbia City for high school. Yeah, there was and several then, of them came at the same time because they joined together. And about the only one didn't at that time was at Detroit. Okay. And Troy was going to Laurelwell, and those people didn't want to come to Columbus City. Okay. And so then when Senator Wheeler, Potts Wheeler, got in to be trustee, he changed them from Edna Troy to come in here, and we were able to buy in. At first we didn't think we'd be able to do that, but then we found out that they would just charge us for the expenses. We didn't have to give any back pay or anything, so it was a great thing, and a lot of but if good thing for Edna Troy because soon thereafter Whitco was built and okay. they had to go and turn to Whitco. Now, uh, why did they want to go to Larwell instead of Columbia City? Was it closer? I think it's smaller and uh, they were used to doing that. Okay. Very unique. They were they were happy going to Larwell like most people are once you get there and you don't yes. want to change. Yes. So it was quite a change for some of them. And uh, sometime, uh, I suppose, in the late uh, 50s, uh, the Jefferson Townships came to uh, Columbia City High School uh, and Washington Township. You see, they, they, found, they built the new one in 1958. Okay. So it wasn't until 1958 that they brought all the high school students. That all the high school, for, uh, like Coesi. Coesi, right. Okay. They all came in at the same time at that point. And, uh, Except for Edna Troy. And so that, that left Cherry Busco and Smith Township uh, as one high school. Right. And uh, and then later Whitco with Laurel and um, was Pearson. There? Pearson, okay. Right. Right. So there's both of those. Smith Green, for example, uh, has two counties involved or something okay. like that, but we didn't have here. But it was a it was a tough time for a lot of people to make that adjustment, and the big thing is too that I think once they got in and began to take part, but it okay. took them a long time to see. They lost their identity to some extent, didn't they? And like uh, a uh, Larwell High School, you know, you went to Larwell High School, you were from Larwell, uh, you lost a certain identity there. Yeah, I, th I think there's. There's some things were lost by that too, because uh -huh. there was a closeness of people that you no longer had. Yes, but you gain in a quality of education. That's what I believe to be true. Okay, okay. Well, thank you very much for coming today. It's my honor. Thank you too.